In this short presentation, what's geography, transport and urban development got to do got to do with it? Simon Kingham, that's me, and Lindsay Conroe, who you'll hear later, are going to chat a little bit about geography and COVID-19. So we are um, in the School of Earth and Environment at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I hope you enjoy it. The aims of this talk are really to understand the relevance or importance of geography to COVID-19. We'll look at the geographical spread of disease, disease, disease dispersion and transport, impacts on public transport, the role of urban design, social distancing, um, tracking, and then we'll end with a little bit on climate change and some future challenges and how the future of our towns and cities might look. What you can see in this animated figure is the number of cases from January the 21st starting in China and the very steep growth of those number of cases. Now the other countries then start coming through um, and the curves then low in some cases steeper but you can see China's curve um, very flattening quite early and others like the United States carrying on and I guess this is a preliminary way of looking at this through geography. In this map you can see a traditional map presenting the growth and the movement of cases from different countries starting in China going to Europe then to North America and then pretty much to the rest of the world. You can look at the link below and you can go and examine that yourself and have a play around and, and, and change various criteria as well. The static dashboard shows a map, it shows some figures, this is using data from the Ministry of Health um, put together by Eagle Technology but it shows a range of different things and again you can follow the link and find a whole range of um, different data sets. You can zoom in on different places, look at the numbers changing over time. The study of disease distribution and dispersion by geographers is not new. One of the earliest and most well-known pieces of work is uh, a book called The Slow Plague, A Geography of the AIDS Epidemic. There was some work done by Peter Gould, a very eminent geographer, originally born in Britain, but sp who spent much of his time at Penn State University in the US, who examined the spread of AIDS um, through a geographical lens, and a, and a very interesting piece of work that was, and pioneering piece of work. And now geographers look at dispersion of diseases in, many, in multiple ways. This shows the heading of an article by Ling Bian, of University of Buffalo and how there's multiple methodologies. So he talks about population based wave models, subpopulation models, etc. etc. The point is here that there's multiple spatial ways of examining the distribution and dispersion of disease. And the tools of the modern geographer are tools like geospatial information systems. Um, and so geographers are now using GIS to help examine issues like the spread of disease. This next example uses um, a software package called Shiny Apps, which is developed out of a statistical package called R, which is an open source package. The beauty of that means that you, it's free um, um, to produce and easy, relatively easy to produce maps. And what you can see in this example is the development of COVID and spread of it, starting back in the 22nd of March, going through to the 15th of April. And you can see the spread, as we saw earlier, you've got a mixture of the colours of the background colours are active cases per 100,000 and the circles show the actual number of cases. Uh, what you can also see is a change over time both as new cases in the top figure on the left and as cumulative cases um, with the dotted line just below that. You can also look at active, new, cumulative, you can data for SARS, you can look at data for swine flu and Ebola. Very clever piece of work this one done by the London High School, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We've started by looking at the dispersion of disease and the role of geography and now what we're going to do is go on and look at the role of transport in that disease dispersion. And research has shown us that transport and the dispersion of this type of disease isn't new. So there's some research came out of the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s that highlighted the importance of international air travel and we've seen that of course in New Zealand where the vast majority of cases certainly early on were linked to air travel and this particular piece by the um, CDC went on to say the mismanagement of mobility in a public health can do more than exacerbate a disease. And they talk about how it can make it a lot worse. And they end by saying SARS has demonstrated the importance of integrating global public health into a strategy of comprehensive management of population mobility. And transport is incredibly important. It doesn't just carry fit people. It also moves food and medical supplies. So cutting off your, your transport networks it has dramatic effects. In the case of New Zealand and Australia to a lesser extent, but certainly in the case of New Zealand, we, we did it early. We closed our borders, but we had to ensure that movements of food and medical supplies could continue. 
when countries started to close their borders, we saw huge um, traffic jams as people tried to get to their destinations quickly and end their journey. We've also seen some dramatic changes in air quality as a result of less traffic as people will stop moving around towns and cities, for instance, in New Zealand, but also globally as well. These sets of images from the Guardian newspaper show the dramatic change in the quality of the air post COVID. What you can see is on the left, you can see pre COVID where you've got smog and, and pollution. And on the right, you can see much cleaner environments. Now the traffic is not operating in these cities. It's worth following the link as you can see more about it and read more about it. In the meantime, I'm now going to pass you on to Lindsay, who's going to talk a little bit about transport um, post COVID. Hello, it's me, Lindsay Conroe, broadcasting live from Christchurch Central City and ready to talk a little bit about some public transport and non-motorized mobility issues in the context of the current pandemic and lockdown scenario. Maybe a little bit about some, some thoughts going forward post-lockdown as well. In class, we've touched on some of the benefits of public transport in terms of reducing traffic congestion and improving mobility. But in the current context of social distancing, we have this issue where it's really difficult to maintain the proper social distance. So that two meters or six feet distance from one another when you're using public transportation. So Different agencies, different cities have had to implement changes to their operations, to their service, the procedures. Early on into the pandemic, that involved things like eliminating cash payments, eliminating payments altogether, rear boarding instead of boarding at the front. But as kind of the pandemic has extended, we've seen drops in ridership and changes to service schedules overall. A great deal of the reduction in public transport use can be attributed to increases in telecommuting, right? So more people are working from home now. But even with reduced ridership numbers and potential risk for disease transmission, we can't entirely shut down public transport because it's an essential public service. Some people rely on it to get around. Nevertheless, in response to that reduced demand from having fewer commuters, and the potential transmission risk, uh, many agencies have cut services for public transport and are even actively discouraging ridership in favor of alternative modes. Now, transit in a lot of places already struggles for funding, and we have potentially negative impacts down the line if we only use ridership numbers to measure and monitor transit success. So yes, pandemics are not so great for public transport. If you remember back to some of our earlier discussions about it, from an urban design and development standpoint, one of the points of mass transit is to solve a basic problem of urban geometry. We want to move a lot of people through a limited amount of space, and a bus is more space efficient than a car. So we often talk about transport costs in terms of dollars rather than space, but in that spatial context, we typically encourage more efficient uses of space, AKA mass transit, public transport, but that doesn't really apply so much when people are following physical distancing as they should, and a private vehicle might actually be a better travel mode in that context. So with the drop in ridership and potential lost revenue for transit agencies, they may be looking to make some changes to recoup costs as we move forward. All right, this is a little bit of a public transport sidebar. Keep in mind, the current reductions in transit service are an attempt to both reduce disease transmission, but also to reduce operational costs while transit demand is low. We can think of kind of these three different categories of public transport riders. We have all purpose who use public transport for everything, commuters who use it only for work, and occasional riders who use a different mode for their primary 
means to get around, but will use public transport if it's convenient or necessary. So transit riders are sensitive to changes in service quality, regardless of car ownership. It's one of the things that we figured out from studying trends and behaviors with respect to public transport. The most important factor for public transport success is dependable, frequent service that goes where people need to go. We have to think about some of the potential longer term impacts to public transport, even as we come out of lockdown and shelter in place. We're likely to have to maintain social distancing measures for quite a while. The most immediate threat to public transport, though, is probably through funding. A lot of public transport funding comes from tax revenues rather than fares from ridership. And tax revenue is going to be reduced pretty much across the board. And so public transport will take a hit on that. But pushing that issue aside, we have the thing of service frequency and hours. And if they are cut longer term, it could eventually drive ridership even lower because public transport becomes a less convenient option for people. And as it becomes less convenient, we have even lower ridership. And so we have to cut service and hours even more, and then we have even less ridership and so on. Uh, yeah, until tra transit has a really hard time recovering. But uh, nevertheless, we might be able to spin some of this into positives. I don't know. But we have less vehicle traffic on the road right now. And if we kind of look at system efficiency, we might see that buses, for example, are having better headways, are able to stick to their schedules more closely because there's less congestion on the road. And with uh, less vehicle traffic, we might see people giving cycling a try, for example. On the topic of giving cycling a try, Way back in early March, I started to see these reports about a surge in cycling in New York City. This was partially spurred by the mayor, Bill de Blasio, suggesting that rush hour commuters use alternative modes like biking or walking rather than um, use the typically crowded subway system. And the result is kind of cool. People are really doing it they reported 67% more rides this March, so in 2020, compared to the same time last year. Not all cities are experiencing the same effect in terms of increased cycling, but are rather seeing reduced travel overall. But the good thing, I guess, about this is that it's showing that people are willing to make a change. We already know that the benefits of cycling are numerous, but in a COVID-19 pandemic context, we have this most immediate benefit of using it as an alternative travel mode to avoid public transport and also as an opportunity for physical activity. As I'm sure you are well aware, we have lockdown or shelter in place orders instituted pretty much worldwide, and that's to reduce the risk of disease transmission but confinement can have its own health risks. We have people who might be living in dense residential areas that have little access to private green space. People might also be experiencing higher anxiety. And so we need to maintain physical activity and outdoor time because they're both associated with physical and mental well-being. Walking and cycling, particularly around green space, are good for mental and physical health and can be compatible with social distancing as long as people are responsible, maintain their six feet or two meters, and we can keep transmission risk low. As I've kind of already mentioned, space, as in physical space, is a commodity in the urban environment. And in order to give people real alternatives that let them travel and engage in physical activity while also practicing effective social distancing, we need to see solutions that can be rapidly and easily implemented. So we need to be on quick timescales like 
months, less than months, rather than years that it sometimes takes to make infrastructure changes in a city. It's an opportunity to make non-motorized travel and recreation easier for people, but we have to reconfigure some urban spaces to make it possible. So how can we make changes to facilitate mobility in the distancing context? We also have to consider safety because we might have people who aren't used to walking as much or aren't used to riding bikes on city streets, for example. Something kind of cool that has developed during this lockdown and social distancing situation is that cities worldwide are implementing tactical urbanism approaches to altering the built environment. So that's changing urban spaces in ways that accommodate physical activity and social distancing. Uh, tactical urbanism was a thing before the pandemic and it wasn't necessarily aimed at social distancing, but uh, it involves low cost, often temporary changes to urban spaces that can be put into place quickly and easily. And they're often um, things that are put in place to just try stuff out in an urban space in terms of altering it in ways that make people safer, more comfortable, whatever it is. So some of the approaches are what I've pictured here. You can see on the left, this is somewhere in Auckland. These planter boxes have been placed on the traffic side of a cycle lane, and that's to keep cyclists separated from the vehicle traffic. It increases safety. And then we can also use similar ideas to create temporary lanes or widen pedestrian areas so that people have more room to move around. Uh, we can also do things that are less like tactical urbanism, like changing the traffic system by lowering speeds or restricting traffic or closing streets to vehicle altogether. I guess closing streets is kind of a tactical urbanism approach. At any rate, we're basically effectively um, increasing the urban space that we allocate to these active modes for leisure or for commuting. And we're also increasing safety to protect people from injury. These are a couple of illustrations that are helpful in kind of visualizing some of the measures that cities are taking to facilitate physical activity, but maintain social distance or to reduce contact points for disease transmission. On the left is a map of measures that have been taken in the US. I know I said that these things were worldwide and this is only the US, but I promise it really is worldwide. So you can see things like street closures and temporary bike lanes that are measures for increasing space for people to move around basically. And then things like fare suspension and automated crossings that are reducing contact points. Automated crossings, by the way, are when you have the beg buttons at intersections where you as a pedestrian have to push the button to get the light to change. Um, so those have just been automated so that they're, they're cycling through the traffic lights at regular intervals rather than waiting for a pedestrian to show up. And then on the right, you can see this illustration that is showing how we can take a four lane road reduce it down to two lanes for driving, use the extra lanes for people to either walk or cycle. Uh, that was done by O2, and it's kind of their vision for some streets in Calgary. So it is worldwide, USA and Canada. These are a couple more examples of the sort of tactical urban changes that cities might make to accommodate both physical activity and social distancing. Closing streets to through traffic on the left and using paint and planter boxes to extend pedestrian spaces on the right. Planter boxes being a tactical urbanism favorite. Uh, but that is Federal Street in Auckland and that was already in place before the pandemic. Like I said, tactical urbanism has been a thing before this and it falls under the umbrella. John mentioned this in a, in a previous lecture, but it falls under the umbrella of new urbanism. So those efforts to create sustainable, walkable, comfortable and safe spaces for people to live 
in urban areas. So what they've done here is, so they physically have separated people from traffic with the planter boxes, but also using the paint, they've extended the curb that you can see is curved um, in the left-hand side of that photo. You can see it's curved and they've used paint to extend that and the planter boxes to extend that out to again, be squared off. So cars have to turn more slowly at that intersection. And then also they've used the circles of paint to create kind of a visual field that helps basically drivers be more aware of pedestrians in the area. To mildly expand on the tactical urbanism was a thing before the pandemic, but also revisit this image I had included of the headline, New Zealand, first country to fund pop-up bike lanes, widen sidewalks during lockdown. Yes, Associate Minister of Transport, Julian Genter, has announced recently that the government is making this extra funding for councils can propose projects within the scope of tactical urbanism approaches to expanding urban space so people can get around and maintain social distance, especially as we move out of the level four lockdown. The money for this is coming from an already existing program that supports projects using tactical urbanism techniques. It's called Innovating Streets for People Fund. Uh, those are links. You can click them if you would like to read more about the fund. The photo that I included on the previous slide of Federal Street in Auckland is a product of that program. Um, and like I said, it's, it's already been implemented. It's already in place. And this could potentially be a really cool opportunity for communities to experiment and to experience what changes to their urban space might really be like. Again, we can think about the potential longer term impacts on people's physical and mental well being in urban areas, on urban design and development, how we use urban space, overall, people's mobility, accessibility, and safety in urban areas, and consider whether these are things that we can use as takeaway for longer term changes to transport systems or to these urban design features that might improve people's physical and mental well-being even outside of the pandemic scenario. All right, that's it for COVID-19 and how we move around urban spaces in the pandemic context. So, yep, wash your hands and stay at home. Another example of geography is the power of social distancing, because this is all about the social interaction of people with each other. And this figure shows that one person infects, say, two and a half people. And if everybody infects two and a half people, after 30 days, that one person has actually ended up infecting over 400 people. With 50% less exposure, you end up in 30 days with 15 people infected. And with 75% less, you end up with two and a half people infected. And this is all about mobility of people, people, space they're in, the space they intersect. One of the neatest ways of visualizing this is some graphics put together by the Washington Post. In the first example, we see the free movement of people. You can imagine that one person um, interacts with everyone around them and how quickly that spreads from one person to another, to another, to another and how the disease spreads incredibly quickly because it's uncon unconfined. One person intersects with another person who then intersects, but that first person is also continually intersecting with people. The second example is really what happened in China. And what China ch decided to do after it had the outbreak is what they, we sometimes always sometimes refer to as forced quarantine, where they tried to keep all the six people away so they stopped them moving around. And the problem is it kind of works to an extent, but it doesn't because those people do still infect other people. So you get not as fast dispersion of the disease, but still reasonably fast dispersion. The next example is what we're doing where we have some form of social isolation. In this particular example, 25%, so a quarter of people still move around and 75% socially isolate. So they stay away from the others. They don't move. And therefore the only people they can infect are in the context of, or how we talked about in New Zealand, the people in their bubble. 
what you can see there's fairly fast movement <clears throat> because the 25 percent of people that are still out there are still infecting people um, and they're still going around their business the next example is where one in eight people are moving around so the spread of the disease is much much slower uh, and this can be seen very clearly from this example where people are not moving around the disease is spreading far slower because there's only one in eight people and they um, are therefore not intersecting so the other people when they hit them they, they don't spread that disease because they're not intersecting them so follow the link to the Washington Post you can see that simulation um, more as well a very good simulation it is I think to explain the idea of social distancing what the Washington Post visualization shows is how you can flatten the curve so with the free fall you have a very steep curve your hospital can't cope the pink area shows the people recovered but by then the hospitals haven't coped and people have many people have died if you attempt to quarantine like the Chinese you get a slightly different example where you still get quite high peaks moderate distancing and extensive distancing you're really flattening the curve and you're decreasing the number of people getting sick as well and the other really important part of this is that we know that social ties are really important to mental health um, and, and as we socially isolate it's important to maintain mental health and we've, we've seen governments doing a lot of work about saying be kind to each other be in contact with each other because we know that the health of people is very closely linked to their social interaction and their social time and these links between social isolation and what we've seen during COVID and mental health are not new we know how we design our cities can affect our well-being and so if we design them badly you could design loneliness into cities and communities or you can design communities to encourage people to have social interaction and therefore have better mental health in fact there's a whole journal dedicated to the links and relationship between urban design and mental health and if you follow that link below you can just see that there's there's masses of articles on this just to show the importance of urban design and the nature of the places we live in and where places we build and design and are, are so important to our mental well-being and as geographers we're really interested in inequality and inequity and what we know from pandemics is that they don't affect people equally that the poor communities generally do worse so we can see the top people from the global policy journal looking at um, in the context of coronavirus but this isn't new in the piece below the Brookings, Brookings Institute said that actually pandemics when they hit they usually hit the poor first and worst in many cases they may not in, in coronavirus possibly not but what we do know is that the people on lower incomes have less ability to protect themselves we know we can see that they have less protect ability to socially distance less access to medical resources etc what we also know is that we rely on them to do the jobs that keep society going so the nurses the bus drivers the people working in supermarkets the people cleaning the streets these sorts of roles are not highly paid jobs and yet we are relying on them at the moment in the context of inequality we also know that that marginalized ethnic groups tend to do worse in pandemics um, in New Zealand this applies to Mali and of course we have our treaty obligations um, and to know more about this read this excellent piece by Dr Rhys Jones in the spin-off one of the things we've heard about a lot recently is contact tracing so I, I identifying who people have been in touch with so you can identify who may have the, the disease or the illness next increasingly what we're starting to see is people turning to geospatial technologies to help do this so the idea that you can track people you can see where they've been and you can see the people they've been in contact with and so new apps are being developed and they won't be a total solution but they should certainly be able to help identify who's been in interacting with people who've contracted COVID-19 and this debate's being had in New Zealand where we're saying can smartphones help stop the spread of the disease and there's some ethical issues about this there's some data issues some technology issues and one of New Zealand's um, experts on this is actually uh, my colleague in the University of Canterbury's own uh, Malcolm Campbell one of the things we're now thinking is is how do we stimulate the economy so a lot of money has been spent by governments a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and so we know historically after this sort of event happens that you stimulate the economy by investing often in infrastructure projects and people are now questioning that let's not just go back to type um, let's actually think about doing these so that we don't produce greenhouse gas emissions that we create communities and places that are healthy for people so even people like the World Bank are talking about this and New Zealand's own climate change commission are saying let's take this opportunity to stimulate the economy 
in a low carbon way. So to summarize, what we've seen is that the dispersion of disease, when you're talking about a, a, a contagious disease, is very geographical. We've seen that transport is a key role. We know in New Zealand that nearly all our cases, particularly at the start, were linked to international travel. If we didn't have international travel, we wouldn't have COVID-19. We've also seen in, in Lindsay's section about the links between COVID-19 and public transport. And then we've talked about, I guess, micro mobility and ex um, with the social distancing. So those small spaces people live in that if you um, socially distance, you reduce the spread um, of the disease. But you also socially isolate and there can be links between social isolation and mental health. And they are linked then to urban form. They're like a microcosm of how we design our communities. And if we design our communities wrong, we create socially isolated individuals and socially isolated individuals can lead to mental health problems. And finally, we've considered the role of how we might stimulate the economy in a climate friendly way. So invest in projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions rather than increasing them. I hope you've enjoyed this, this short um, presentation and, and understand the links between um, geography and COVID-19, particularly through the lens of urban development and transport. Thank you very much. Bye.